Oh yeah, what's up everyone? Happy Friday. Don't forget to say hi when you join. I see a few of you out there. Latuka, what's up? Happy Friday, y'all gonna be a good one we got the fresh prince of seo ross simmons today is our special guest please be sure to think of your questions and ask them during our conversation and i will address them as they were received i see about 20 of you out there don't be shy say hi Come on, what's up, my man? Oh, I see Ross. Ross just joined the the live what's up ross how you doing good 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 how are you good good okay so right now i'm in like the just the show countdown i just say what's up to everyone in the live chat and then i i will introduce you in in about um about eight minutes into the show i'll go over some like news and stuff like that and then cool I'll call you right in sounds good all right i like the background music oh yeah <laughs> Eleanor, what's up? John Wick, what's up? I see a bunch of you guys out there. Don't be shy. Say hi. We got about three more minutes. guys i'm gonna go ahead and pick this week's winners we got about less than three minutes left again if you want to get entered automatically to the picker wheel just put i love seo in the live chats or in the comments below so let's go ahead and pick this week's winners all right winner one number one Even on. Be sure to email me, Dre at SEO.video. Joshua Fletcher, email me. One more, one more. Mother's Community. All right, guys, if you're here in the live chat, be sure to say hi, claim your prize. This is going to be a fun one, guys. got questions get them prepared as I will ask them in the order they are received oh yeah happy Friday Yeah, yeah. Hey. 
Time to get it started, no delay, let's work. Wanna see you be an SEO expert. Paul Andre Devera, steady dropping knowledge. Over 15 years in the game, so he knows all about it. Master the art of SEO, you will be amazed. Time to get your brand off page to on page. Dropping knowledge, legendary for sure. Whether you're just getting started, a self-employed entrepreneur. Yeah, let's go. Subscribe to the SEO video show. Hey. Hey, hey, welcome to another episode of the SEO Video Show where SEO is alive and fun. My name is Paul Andre DeVera, aka Dre, and I curate SEO videos released in the past week into about one minute clips. My favorite part of the show is when I get to introduce my guest, and my guest this week is the founder of Foundation Digital, Ross Simmons. Before we get started, let's say what's up to everyone in chat. I see Amon, John Wick, Uram, Latika, Stefan, Glenn. What's up, everyone? Be sure to put I Love SEO in the live chat or in the section below to get entered in next week's giveaway. Tune in to the pre-show next week and see if you won. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Now let's get on with the show. This is Ted DiBiase, the Million Dollar Man. <laughs> Why do SEOs love the farmer's market? Lots of organic content. <laughs> All right, let's get started with a couple of uh, Google updates. In the blog post this week, Google is updating their job posting guidelines to improve the quality of the job seekers. Uh, there's a new direct apply property, uh, a new editorial content policy, and they also give a few tips on improving job seeker trust. Trust is becoming more and more of a criti is critical when it comes to Google. Companies like WordProof has been helping in this area with blockchain. Let's listen in on the founder of Yoast on Kiffin Index channel on what this is all about it into WordProof. It's built by a, a Dutch friend of ours. They timestamp on the blockchain. You, you can just verify that you wrote that piece of content and you can reproduce the hash that we store in the blockchain at that point, given our methods. We add that blockchain timestamp as schema.org metadata into that article. So that ties it all together and it makes it very simple to just, well, even for simple things, right? Like um, your terms of service, you can just timestamp them at the time of a transaction and prove that at the time of transaction, these were the terms of service that apply to your transaction. I think there's a whole lot of these things where, where over time, those things become more important. And then as we can later on also tie people to those timestamps. So I can say, hey, this was created by Yoast at that per point in time. That has true value. I mean, that, that actually shows that someone with an opinion on SEO, that that wasn't just someone with an opinion, that it was me. And, and then it's up to you to decide whether I have the credentials to be able to say something that you want to trust or not. But at least you can verify that that person is truly that person. What are your thoughts on this idea of blockchain and timestamps? I personally love the idea to see how it can create trust for Google and its readers. In, a, in the following, in the next clip, uh, Ross Hutchin, CEO of Sage Media, was on the copywriting course channel with Neville, and he was asked to answer, how can you rank something number one in about a minute? And I thought this a question, his answer was pretty cool. Let's check it out. First, be an expert for that thing. So if you're, you're you're a chef and you want to rank for how to cook an egg, you need to start by being an expert. That's a pretty good starting point. Hopefully you have a website at the same time as saying that. Uh, you search for that search. You see what's on the search engine result page. If you see videos, that means you need a video. If you see uh, images, that means you need images. If you don't see either and you just see a listicle, that's a good uh, example that you might just need a list of the top things to do in Austin instead. So then do that in-depth research using your expertise to apply your specific function to it. Ideally, it's better than those other results based on your specific expertise. Put it in your, on your website, make it look good. Uh, ideally better than the other results on that search engine result page. And then reach out to people that might link to that asset to get it um, covered. Hopefully it is the best thing for that search engine result page. And when people start linking to it, Google will see it as the most authoritative and you'll rank. Wow. That was actually pretty good. All you need is the power of observation, as Matthew Woodward would say. The answer to number one rankings on Google is right there on Google. Observe the search engine results and pages and just do it better. 
All right, Robbie Richards, a past guest on the show, released a video this week explaining the importance of question-based keywords. Let's check it out. Question-based keywords can be an absolute goldmine for a couple of reasons. The first one is that they often have a much higher degree of intent. And if you think about it, when people are searching for specific types of questions in the SERP, they're often looking for a very specific solution to a problem that they have and often in a short period of time. So it's a great opportunity to then insert your product or that of an affiliate product into the conversation and showcase that as a solution to that problem. And the second reason is oftentimes question-based keywords have a much lower degree of keyword competition and you often don't need to create long form content or build any links at all in order to rank on the first page for these terms. Be sure to watch the full video. He gives four places to grab question-based keywords using tools. People also ask Reddit and Quora. A couple weeks ago, our guest Leo Solis spoke about creating personas to do keyword research. Uh, this week on the SEMrush channel, uh, Catherine Strickton of Copy House talks about using buyer personas to build SEO driven content. Let's check it out. B2B, isn't that just for B2C? But I believe that having a buyer persona cuts through the noise because it allows you to create hyper-personalized content that speaks directly to your audience. So it makes them sit up. It makes them listen to you. It makes them go, this person knows exactly what I'm going through and they know how to help me. It also helps you understand the type of content your audience is going to find beneficial and meaningful. So there's no point in creating content that your audience doesn't want. Otherwise, you're just spinning in circles by yourself. It also helps you understand their online behavior. So where do they spend their time? What keywords do they use? What are they looking for when they use those keywords? Which then obviously feeds into search intent as well. So I really believe that good content marketing is really about starting conversations and building relationships. Even if your sales team is massive, you cannot be everywhere at once. You can't have lots and lots and lots of one-on-one -on -one conversations. But what you can do is you can create content that helps people at scale, that starts these conversations that are so personalized that it makes it seem like you know them. You know what they want, what they need, what questions they have, and you're providing all of this to them, which then helps you build that relationship and ultimately nurture leads throughout the funnel. The first thing I always ask working, working with a new company or client is asking for their persona docs. It's the quickest way to figure out a brand's, a brand, you know, a brand new company or client's audience and will help you become that SEO rock star. This brings me to my guest today, a content marketing rock star who dropped so many knowledge bombs on LinkedIn and Twitter. Please uh, ask all your content marketing questions in the live chat and I will address them as they were received. Uh, please let me go, let me get things ready here. Please don't forget to like and subscribe while we get, uh, get things ready here. All right. Ross is the founder of Foundation as a marketer and passionate about all things tech. He is an entrepreneur who consistently strives to give back. Over the past decade, he has worked closely with a wide range of brands globally, ranging from Fortune 500 companies and up-and-coming startups. He's been published on Forbes, Huntington Post, Business Insider, VentureBeat, BET, CBC, Social Media Examiner, and more. He was named in Mashable as one of the top Snapchat marketers in the world. He has been a guest speaker at Search Love, CTA Con, MozCon, and more. He loves 90s hip-hop and the world wrestling federation please welcome the fresh prince of seo ross simmons my man how are you doing today on? i'm doing great feeling even better after that intro amazing i love the energy thanks for having me andre this is uh this is gonna be fun i'm excited oh yeah oh yeah i swear we would have been best friends or something when we were younger because i love wrestling i love that 90s hip-hop i mean if you could tell that beat it. i started oh man I did. between the music at the beginning and then ted dibiase showing up i was like i'm with my people i like it i like it yep yep all right, Ross, you know, what? I want to just thank you real quick because uh, all the knowledge bombs you dropped on LinkedIn, I look forward to every single tweet and every single LinkedIn post you post out there because, hey, it's, it's inspiring, it's insightful, and it just makes appreciate sense. It. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. 
Yeah, thanks. I, I really do try to deliver as much knowledge bombs as I can on LinkedIn and on Twitter. So thanks for thanks for that. I appreciate it. I'm glad you found them valuable. All right, all right. I want to get right to it here. Okay, so earlier, I want to know, like, in one minute, how does Ross rank number yep. one on Google? <laughs> Great question. So how does Ross rank number one on Google? Just by putting out content right like it comes down to that it's like let's double down on creating great content and giving value to the world and hopefully the world gives value back and that's kind of the mantra that i bring to the table with all things whether it's seo content marketing social etc it's all about the value of the content it's all about the value of the content first knowledge bomb just dropped okay <laughs> let's take this back let's take this back real quick yeah. let, me rewind, let me rewind real quick <laughs> Let's, let's see, how did Ross first get into SEO? Good question. So it started accidentally. So I'm a digital marketing geek, no doubt about it, but I've always been into the internet. So I, I started a fantasy football blog when I was in university so many moons ago i'm not going to age myself but it was a long time ago and i was creating content on fantasy sports and i had to rank in google to get traffic so i started to reverse engineer how to do it i was in all the forums studying it learning about it self-taught 100 percent i had a marketing degree but they weren't teaching seo they weren't teaching social media none of those things were in the syllabus so i was self-taught and i started to generate a lot of traffic and traction on the content i was creating on fantasy sports that quickly allowed me to pay for a good chunk of my tuition at university and i was like whoa this internet thing is gonna last this content thing where some kid in his parents basement in nova scotia canada is able to reach hundreds of thousands of people talking about sports this is real like this is an opportunity so i doubled down on it i started to create more and more content about sports but eventually what happened was very interesting my marks started to drop because i was spending so much time writing content about seo i wasn't paying attention in school and my mom was like ross i think it's time to shift back to focusing on your degree so i started to write about marketing i started to write about social media i started to write about seo and in that process i continued to fine tune my craft and ultimately long story a little bit longer you fast forward and that blog that i started to create about marketing eventually became my career at rosssimmons.com which eventually evolved into foundation marketing Love it, love it, love it. Nice snapshot of that. Okay, so I'm curious then, I mean, so you said you're visiting forums when you're learning it and you're self-taught. Was there anyone in particular that you're following back then? Oh man, I can't, everyone had uh, aliases back then. So like oh. no one really was themselves in the forum. So I was in all of the various like Moz forums, the Black Hat World forums, mm -hmm. like you name it, I was in there. Um, and everyone just had like forum names. So like my name back then, I don't even remember what it was, but it was not Ross Simmons. Like everybody <laughs> just was operating under aliases. This was before like social identity and personal branding was even a thing. Got it, got it. Okay, okay. I mean, I was in those forums too. I think mine was a little um, easy to re like remember. I was called Papa Dre back then. So if you guys want to check it. me out, <laughs> I was Papa Dre back in Black Hat World days. So if you have look at my That's old post awesome. back there. All right, okay. You know what? I need to like. Uh, I was, you know, I was, when I was doing some research, I wanted to like learn a little bit more about you, and I actually found something interesting cool. here. I wanted to see like yeah. what what was what does this quote mean to you? You know, nothing in this world mm. can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent genius will not yeah. unrewarded genius is almost a proverb education will not the world is full of educated dere dere derelicts persistence and determination alone are omnipotent what does this yeah. uh, quote mean to you so for me I, I love this quote it's one that i came across many many moons ago when i was in, in university at the early days and i quickly resonated with it because i very quickly in university would come across very talented, very brilliant minds. But those people sometimes just didn't work hard. And without the actual persistence to work hard, 
that talent, that genius oftentimes went to waste. And I always said to myself, like, I may not be the math genius. I may not be the physicist. I married that person, um, but I will outwork anyone. And I will put in the time. I will be persistent. I will put in the late nights. I will go the extra mile. And I have learned the like over the course of my life, like it really does come down to persistence. It's very easy to get wavered when you get met with an obstacle and say, I'm not going to continue. I've met people who have the highest IQ possible, but as soon as they're met with a little bit of confrontation, they're met with some resistance, they crumble. So for me, what this quote means is you need to build a bit of a um, obsession in many ways with progress and persistence and relentless of striving to do more, or you will essentially never achieve the outcomes that you truly were capable of if you would have persisted through it. So that's why I love this quote. I came across it in the early days and I resonated with it because I always said, like, I may not be the smartest person in the room, but I will try my hardest to push 100% and give 100% of what I got. Power of persistence, guys. The power of persistence. Okay, it looks like we got our first question here in the live chats. Let's go ahead and pull this up here. We have one from Aman, a partner from social media, media, and SlideShare. Ross, can you please share your yeah. views on the best way to distribute content in the future? Great question. So I believe it's in niche communities. So if you look at my career over time, there's one thing that is consistent time and time again, and it's the importance of understanding the value of going into niche communities and spreading your content there. So when I was creating that fantasy sports blog, the reason why it was so successful is because I understood not only search, but I also understood the fact that I needed to take that content and seed it into communities where fantasy football people, people who used it, played it, et cetera, were spending time. So across the board, even today, I think that there is a massive arbitrage opportunity for marketers and creators to look for niche communities, whether it's in Facebook groups, whether it's in a subreddit, whether it's a LinkedIn group, whether it's a YouTube channel, whether it's a podcast network, you name it. Just because something is small doesn't mean that it's not powerful. So you can find these niche communities and seed your content into them and unlock ridiculous, amazing returns. So if I was to say where brands should be focused is finding the communities where their audience already is spending time, reverse engineer the type of content that that community wants, Think about how you can learn from the content that has been the best in that subreddit, in that Facebook group, in that community, create it, apply your brand spin to it, and then seed it back to that group. And this is consistent across all industries, all niches. Like I haven't found an industry today where there isn't some, some, some element of the audience spending time somewhere talking about this topic, whether it's accountants, whether it's engineers, whether it's moms, whether it's dads, whether it's parents, you name it, there is a subreddit, a niche, a community group somewhere out there on the internet where you can reach the people you're trying to connect with. Oh man, I'm on niche communities. Jot that down. Okay, okay, okay. I think I got something coming up uh, related here. I was like, I was going to ask that question later on. Amon, you beat me to it. All right. So we, uh, what is your favorite way of like finding content topics? Yeah, good question. So this one seeds well into the last one. So yeah. I think it's all about going into your content creation process with research. Now, when you're creating your content, regardless of the type, regardless of where you're going with it, you have to start with research and the research should be baked off of a goal. So if my goal is to generate backlinks, what my approach is going to be is I'm going to reverse engineer a bunch of content in my industry, in my space that has generated backlinks. For example, let's take 20 sites, let's export all of the content that they have published on their blog over the last, I don't know, 365 days, put that in a spreadsheet. We're gonna sort the content by what content has generated the most backlinks. We're gonna analyze the content that is at the top because those are the posts that have generated the most links. And we're going to look for themes. We're going to see what type of content generated the most backlinks in that industry and in that niche across all of our competition. Once we've done that, we've identified our themes, we're then going to start creating content off of that. So if we see that in a certain industry, research and data-driven content is generating all of the links, what do you think we're gonna create? 
We're going to create data-driven and research-driven content because that's a top of that's a type of content that has demonstrated the ability to achieve the goal that we're setting out to do. You're also going to look for trends in the types of data that they shared and use that to inform the idea. Now, this methodology seems and sounds solely to backlinks, but you can do the same thing for social shares. You're going to go and you're going to analyze how much social shares all of these different posts have. And if that's your goal to generate thought leadership, to generate traction on LinkedIn, to generate traction on Twitter, you're going to sort the content by social shares. And again, see what type of content sorts up to the top. If you start to notice a trend in this regard, that it's controversial content that generates social shares. It's content that is calling out an enemy in a certain niche, a certain space. You're going to use that as inspiration to create your own content as well. And then again, you do that across the board for all different areas. You go into a subreddit. If that's your strategy, if your goal is to have a presence there, you're going to look at all of the various subreddits that your industry and your audience is spending time on. You're going to sort that content by the top posts. You're going to reverse engineer the most successful content in that space and use that for inspiration around the content you create. So this approach, I believe, is tried and true and can be applied across every goal, every objective that a business has. But the key is to start by understanding what you're trying to accomplish. And then you pull out what I call like the Sherlock homeboy approach, which is to reverse engineer <laughs> the different channels and figure out what works within them damn all right man i so we always think about like we're just reverse engineering google but you're reverse engineering like content types con like competitors and like they're, they're con oh my god that's excellent love it love it okay 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 all right so i was like you know again when i was kind of like you know doing some research and once seeing finding some topics i wanted to talk about today i was like i found on your i believe it was something you posted on linkedin you recently shared something okay. uh, on search, int search intent to establish an SEO moat. I'm curious, mm, can, can right. you explain like uh, this strategy? Yeah, so I think at the end of let's start with a fundamental understanding of what a moat is. And I yeah. think a lot of organizations, when they think about a moat, they're thinking about a castle, and that's the right place to start. But a moat is essentially a competitive advantage that goes around your organization that allows you to find a edge so you can compete. So the moat gives you the ability to extract economic value consistently in comparison to your competitors because of strategic decisions that you've made. So when it comes to search, we oftentimes just think of it as a marketing thing. It's a thing inside of our marketing mix that ultimately will hopefully drive results for our business, but we don't really think about it as having an strategic SEO benefit from a business lens. What I mean by that is I believe that SEO has a very significant role in a business's ability to scale and compete globally long term if we think about it the right way. And what I'm meaning by that is that you need to start by thinking about what are the things that your audience are typing into Google on a regular basis that is going to ultimately influence their buying decision. What's going to influence their ability to buy from you when you study that and you understand it whether it's a transactionary search whether it's a educational search if you start with that and start to create content that answers their problems you're going to have a competitive advantage so try to create as many pieces as possible that can rank and that's how you can win love it love it dropping all these knowledge bombs okay okay so i'm curious you know like we have all these content optimization tools out there trying to like yeah. optimize content i mean what what is your content uh, optimization process look like i mean are you looking at word count lsi any like all this stuff i mean yeah. what what does your process kind of look like when you are optimizing content for sure. So it's all of the above. We start with like the qualitative side of things, but we always start with competitive research. So we like to analyze everything in the SERP, right? So we want to look at who are we competing with? What are their headlines? What's the word count? What keywords are they targeting? What's the value of these keywords? And how much value would we be able to extract if we did rank for these different phrases? That's where we like to start. So yes, across the board, our briefs consist of all of the things that you've described from LSI all the way through to the keywords that we're targeting. Um, we also like to do something that's a little bit different in the sense of we try to do a gut check around social sharing as well. So yes, we're very much focused on let's make sure that this content is SEO driven, but how can this also spread on a 
it's like social side. Like, can this content resonate with people that they're going to share it, that they're going to be interested in sharing from a LinkedIn or Twitter standpoint, Facebook standpoint as well. We try to inc- understand and incorporate data that informs that as well. One of the, I would build on that just a little bit more. So one of our things that is not necessarily always related to SEO, let's say, um, is we have a, a concept called the three E's. And if our content doesn't educate people, if it doesn't engage people or entertain people, Mm -hmm. we pretty much across the board will make the recommendation that that's not an asset that we should create and we don't develop it. So that fundamental starting point is definitely something that is key as well when we're crafting our content and figuring out what we should build. Love it, the three E's. I mean, that can go That's with it. anything, with with the videos, the video content. Yeah. That three, those three E's mean a lot, guys. All right, you guys. do it well. Right? Like the entertaining, <laughs> and engaging side of the show is all about that. And I think if people can embrace that in their content, it just stands yeah. out. It helps you go so much further, for sure. <laughs> all right, all right. We got the crowd cheer here. I'm getting okay. hot. I'm getting hot. Oh, you get, it's getting hot here. Let's 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 blow off some, let's blow off some of that smoke. Woo, man. Let's do it. Let's blow let's blow <laughs> some of that let's blow some of that off. All right. So distribution real rules everything around me. Dream. Yeah. Content distribution is yeah. your jam, right? Well, we we should uh, be, we should all be uh, thinking about about this. I mean, what are your top ways? I mean, we talked about your top way of just content distribution, but like why? Uh, is this important? Why should we be thinking about this? And why are not that many people thinking about it? You know, I honestly believe that some of the best creators probably are even listening to this show and they're not going to reach their full potential because of the fear of promoting themselves. I really do believe some of the brightest minds, some of the best creators, whether it's in their own personal professional career, whether it's in their work, whether it's a founder who's creating a startup, whether it's somebody who's built an app, I feel like the fear of being judged, the fear of being unfollowed, the fear of being kind of seen as being too promotional actually does so much harm to creators that it is underestimated how many great minds will actually not reach their full potential. And I preach about distribution often because I get it. Like in high school, my nickname was Shy Ross because I didn't want people to judge me. I was a very quiet kid. I just stuck in my corner. I played in my lane and I didn't really talk much. And I think there's really a lot of creators who are just afraid to share their content, are afraid to share their story, to get it out there to the world, even though they are excellent and great at what they do. When it comes to marketing and content distribution, I always say that you should create once and distribute forever. And the reason why I say that is because we have fallen into a trap as marketers and as creators for years listening to the gurus preach at the top of their lungs, content is king, create more content, write more content and the world will be yours. And guess what? We all listened. We all listened to them and we started to create more content which is great, but that means we're competing with more content than ever before. There's more content that we're competing with ever before. So how do you stand out amongst that content if you just press publish and you hope that Google's gonna send you traffic, if you hope that one person is gonna stumble upon your content, have a great YouTube live video and then happen to extract it and share it on their live. Like the only way that you can consistently rely on your content driving ROI is to distribute it. So I believe that the life cycle of your content doesn't end when you press publish, that's when it just begins. That's when you need to start thinking, how can I share this content on LinkedIn? How can I share this on Twitter? How can I share this on my Instagram story? Can I repurpose this piece of content into a carousel that will live on my Instagram? Can I repurpose this and turn it into a slide share? Can I submit this into a community like Hacker News, Indie Hackers, a subreddit? Where can I spread this content so people are going to see it? But so many of us make the mistake of after pressing publish, we say job done crack the bubbly, let's celebrate, we've done it, our job is complete. That's not the end, that's the beginning. That's when the real work begins and ideally, if you've created a piece of content that is evergreen, you can create it and dis- you can distribute it for the rest of eternity, right? So I think the biggest mistake that people make is the fear of being judged as creators. They also have a question of like, how do you get started? 
how do I start distributing content? You just do it, right? Like the hardest thing that you need to realize, the most important thing you need to realize is like it only takes five seconds to send a tweet. It only takes 10 minutes to write a Twitter thread. It takes 15 minutes to take that same Twitter thread and reverse it a little bit, mix it up, and then share it on LinkedIn and throw in some hashtags. But people don't take the time to do it. Block off time in your calendar to distribute content. And if you're a leader in a content team, make sure that your creators have time or training to understand how to distribute content as well. Yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So, I mean, for me, like I, I'm, I'm so, I, I'm so believing that. I mean, I have no shame in my game. I'll like my own post just to get the algorithm going. I mean, this, that's there's the way you gotta do it, guys. I mean, you gotta make sure you just no shame in your game. Just push it out there. You create great content. I mean, hey, if no one yeah. sees it, what's what's the use, right? Okay, okay. But that's gotta, the thing. Like, that's the other key point, right? Like you just brought it up there, and I want to double click on it for a sec. Right. So, you are creating good content. Why are you afraid to share? right? Like if you are creating good content, you're actually doing a disservice to your audience by not sharing it. That's like me finding a cure to a disease and saying, I'm just going to hold on to it. Nobody gets it because I don't want to be judged. No, you have to give it away. You have to give that to people. Give people the solutions and the value that you've created and be okay with that idea. Like you have to be comfortable with it. So yeah, continue. Sorry, I get passionate about this topic. I think so many people are afraid to create and distribute their stuff, but you have to do it. Gotta give you another knowledge bomb right there. Okay, so I want to go into um, Jonathan Roberts here. Actually, asked a question, um, and I, I kind of want to ask, continue on to this. Like, what SEO content tools do you recommend? Great question. So I'm a big proponent of using multiple tools. Like I find with a lot of the tools that you can use today, every one of them has different data sets. They all have different insights around what they believe the keyword search volume is. But I'm a very active user of things like similar web. I'm a very active user on Ahrefs, very active user on Moz, all of the various platforms. We have subscriptions and use them all. And we bring all of the data together to kind of analyze and come up with things around our recommendations for clients. So we use the full suite, full gamut of various tools. We use Screaming Frog. We use all of those. Um, if there's a, a tool, we probably have in our toolkit. So um, one low cost tool that I would say for folks who are just getting started that we do also like, and I enjoy because it's always there, is Keywords Everywhere. Oh, yeah. It's a very simple plugin. You pop it in, uh, easy to use. I, I strongly recommend that as well. Love it. Love it. Okay. So, I mean, even with uh, continuing on tools, because we talk about like research, but how about like, you know, like the distrib distribution part? I mean, are you using any tools to schedule anything or anything like that? Because I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah are you Anything? I am. So across the board, we use a handful of different tools. We use BuzzSumo, not BuzzSumo, but we do use BuzzSumo. Um, we use tools like uh, Buffer for scheduling tweets and things of that nature. Uh, we use Hootsuite. We use all of those different tools for scheduling, but we've recently even started to just use the good old fashioned native scheduling tools. Now that Twitter allows you to schedule tweets directly on their oh. platform, we've started to tinker and use that. Um, Facebook allows you to schedule directly as well. So we've started to use that because we have a hypothesis yet to be confirmed with data that if you use the native scheduling tools, you might get more reach. We haven't confirmed or denied that yet, um, but we have a belief that that might be a thing. So we've started to use more of those more traditional platforms to schedule natively. I'm started to notice, I haven't used any of them yet, um, but there's things like chirp.app, I believe it's called, for scheduling uh, Twitter threads. And there's another one called, what is it called? Hype Fury, maybe. Um, I've started to see a lot of people starting to use those. I haven't tested them yet, but it seems like there's a handful that are uh, starting to make their way into the world of Twitter threads, which I think is also currently a massive opportunity for brands and businesses, especially individuals that is still underutilized, but can pay ridiculous returns. Love it. So native distribution. I, I actually didn't know that you can schedule stuff within Twitter and Facebook. So thank you for letting us know that. I mean, Stefan, that actually answers your question. I asked it right before you this time. Okay, so we have one here from Aman. Aman asks, for B2B, what's the strategy for brands that are that are already on page one? Great question. Let me geek out on this for a second. Oh. So being on page one 
isn't the goal, right? You want SERP domination. You want to own the entire SERP. You want to have a presence, not only at spot two, not only at spot three, but you want SERP domination. And the way that you get SERP domination is you have to start thinking about ways that you can own a SERP surrounding a certain keyword. You can do that by creating more dynamic content. So Google bought this great company a few years ago called YouTube. I think some of you might be familiar with it. Um, YouTube content shows up in the SERP. So if you can create videos on YouTube that also are aligned with the search intent, you oftentimes can arbitrage the SERP result page and actually get your YouTube videos to show up. So that's one asset that you can create that ultimately also gives you a presence there. Can you also rethink how you even position yourself as a brand to start looking at other content that's showing up in the SERP for the same keyword. Then you start thinking about, okay, can we write a guest blog post for this other contributor who's already ranking on this key on the front page for this keyword? Can we outrank them because we're going to create a piece that's going to be better than that? Or do you reach out to the author of a piece that may be right under you and you say, can you embed my blog post, my YouTube video? Can you inject something about my business in here as well? That gives you ultimately two spots. Then maybe you notice that there's a small brand that happens to be ranking on the front page with you. Is it a brand that is actually relatively new to the industry that you actually might be able to acquire? Is it just a content site? Is it just a small founder who runs this website and you can say, hey, can I buy your website? And then by buying that website, you now have the ability to rank there as well. Is the knowledge graph there and you have an opportunity to think about, okay, we need a Wikipedia page for this SERP and we're going to inject our story into that as well. So when I when I talk to you about strategy for brands that are already on page one, it's simple. You need to get creative around understanding like the job is still not done. You can dominate the SERP entirely if you get deeper with your content. Think about FAQs, right? Like are there other questions that people are asking and is that showing up in a feature snippet somewhere? Okay, if so, let's answer some of those questions as well to make sure that that's linking back to our content and our website too. And if it's already linking to a competitor, you have to ask yourself, is it a content competitor or is it a business competitor? If it's a content competitor, you might be able to partner with them. You might be able to sponsor that article. You might be able to sponsor that page. There's so much that can be done. So long story, a little bit longer. I know I do this a lot. <laughs> you want to look for opportunities to own the SERP instead of just owning a spot in the SERP. Love it, love it. All right, Ahmad, I hope that helps you answer the question. I mean, it helped me. Okay, so I mean to go, um, if, if guys, if you have any more questions, go ahead and ask them in the live chat. I want to c continue asking my own questions here. So the past few uh, speaking events I, uh, I personally attend, I uh, attended was Moz and the MN Search, and you spoke about the concept of marketers should think like investors, right? It was something yeah. where... Um, where you should invest more and guess less. So for those who yeah. um, that didn't get a chance to attend like Moz and the MN Search um, conferences, um, can you explain what, what you think, um, what, what this concept yeah. is about? For sure. So we have all been told for decades that we should probably invest our money, right? We've been told that investing is probably a smart thing for you to do. No matter how old you are, you should probably start investing in something. And that sentiment, should be also articulated to marketing teams every single month, every single week, that they should be thinking about how to invest their resources, time or money into their content marketing initiatives. We oftentimes view marketing as an expense, but it can be an investment. And you can look at tons of examples right now of brands that are generating millions of dollars, sometimes billions of dollars in revenue on the back of content that they invested in 10, 15, 12 years ago. So with that mindset and that fundamental understanding, let's go back to the personal finance side for a second. When you are 80 years old, you have a very different risk portfolio than someone who is 20 years old and what they're going to invest in. Somebody who's early in their life might say, I'm going to throw money at crypto. I'm going to throw money in high growth stocks. I'm going to throw money into the world of genomes and all of that good stuff. But somebody in their 80s might say, I'm going to keep this very straightforward and I'm going to invest in real estate. I'm going to go into REITs, all of that stuff. Same applies in marketing some brand that is trying to take off and explode and quickly shake up feathers and change the industry 
will have a higher risk tolerance than someone who is a market leader and is trying to sustain and maintain their position of dominance in their niche and in their industry. Somebody who's up and coming might say memes are a great play for them. A brand who has already been at the top might say memes are way too high risk. I'm not doing it. I'm not touching it. It's not going to happen. A brand that is up and coming might also be more interested in running some high growth SEO opportunities where they're speculating that a keyword may be in high demand in the future. There's not a lot of competition for this keyword. The volume might be low, but they're going to create content around this keyword today with the hope that if you fast forward 10 years from now, they were one of the first and thus they're able to capture a lot of the market. Let's go back into time a little bit again. Let's say you were one of the early people to create content about remote work. During the Panini, you would have been able to generate a whole bunch of traction on the back of that because you were early at creating content on something that was going to happen projected 10 years out, but it happened within 12 months. So if you can get ahead of the curve on those types of and you are a brand that has a long window of growth and you're playing a sustained leadership position, a portion of your content portfolio should be high growth opportunities in SEO. Now, that's one area, right? Like that risk portfolio is going to be for the high growth content. Those are for those types of brands. Somebody who's more conservative, they might say we need to invest in culture content. We need to invest in content that is going to attract great talent. We need to create content that is thought leadership. You have to view every single content initiative that you take as an investment, and then you measure the return on that investment, as well as looking at the risk associated with it. Creating a meme and sharing it on social is relatively easy to do creating an interactive calculator that has a handful of variables and moving parts and development needed, et cetera. That's a high heavy investment, but it could pay amazing returns, but not every organization can invest in it. So you have to look at everything that you create like an investment. And if you do that and root it in research, you can unlock some amazing returns down the road. Damn! All right. Great movie. Uh, Great movie. <laughs> <laughs> man, I, man, you're dropping all these knowledge bombs. Thank you. Thank you for all these knowledge bombs. All right, guys. I'm coming close to the end here. So if you guys got any questions, uh, please ask them in the live chat. And I'm going to go ahead and ask here. A uh, question I always ask all like my the guests that come on here is like, if someone wants to get into the SEO game, become an SEO professional, what would your advice be and how can yeah. they become that SEO professional? Great question. So my recommendation would be to use the internet as your mentor. I think the biggest thing that you can do in today's world is rely heavily on the internet as your mentor. Don't reach out to 20 SEO experts and ask them to be your mentor. Spend some time up front studying every single video that has shown up for the SEO video show over the last few months and watch every single one. Study it, keep notes, get a notebook and actually write out the transcription. Don't get a transcription app and then download it. Write it out by hand. Ingrain into your mind the fundamentals of SEO. Then some courses that are available for free. A handful of brands offer certificates. You can take those courses as well. Invest the time in learning and then give yourself homework. Now, this is something that I used to do for myself and I think a lot of people early in their career can leverage and utilize that will go very far and it's the actual act of giving yourself homework. So I used to give myself homework like building a WordPress site. This was early days. I told myself, you have to build a WordPress site and then you have to write a document that breaks down what you learned along the way. So I would do it and I would create that. Then I would say, all right, homework next homework is that I need to write a blog post and I need to figure out a way to get it to rank on page one for this keyword. I do it, I try it, I'd fail, I'd struggle, but in that process of actually giving myself homework, I would eventually get there. Now, this is coming from a piece of advice and a recommendation to those who have had a very hard time breaking into the industry. Like I couldn't get a job. I applied to multiple jobs in the world of SEO and to content because I was fresh out of school, nobody would touch me. So if you are able to get a job, do that. Take advantage of getting a job and getting on-site training from people in the space. But if you can't break in on your own, do the work yourself and then demonstrate in those interviews after you've built up a little bit more cred, like, look, 
I'm not just somebody who graduated and has a certificate. I'm not just somebody who is putting their hat in the ring. I have done the work and I have demonstrated through my own work and through my own grind that I am cut out to be inside of your organizations to do SEO. So that would be my advice for those who are having a hard time to get in. And even if you are not, I would still advise you if you want accelerated growth in your career, give yourself homework. And I know that everybody likes to say these days you shouldn't hustle, you shouldn't be pushing that. If you want to do really well, you got to put in some extra work. There's like a very simple correlation between work and output. And if you do more work, oftentimes you have more output. And if you can do more work early on, then it's going to help you in the further um, because you're going to be accelerated ahead. So I do strongly encourage people to find ways, even in your spare time, to think about your craft, to study your craft. And yes, you have to rest. It is important. You have to take a break. You have to take care of yourself. You can't have the grime right if you don't have your mind right. But you do need to also put in the work to get excellent in your craft. Love it, love it. Do your homework and put in the work. All right, guys, we got a we got a comment here from Amon. Awesome show. Thank you, Ross, for coming by here. Uh, if there's any uh, last advice or comments to make this episode feel complete for you, please share it. Share. Yeah, I think honestly, I would just say shout out to you for bringing this show to life. I think the industry needs more content like this. So Dre, my hat's off to you. Keep it up. Keep pushing out this value. You're essentially helping elevate the SEO industry. And that's what we need. Like at the end of the day, the more we can all grow, the more we can all experiment, the more we can all tinker and share ideas and elevate each other as an industry, the better we are able to serve our clients, the better we're going to be able to serve the companies we're in. And to me, that's what it's all about. So I hope you're listeners were able to get some value out of this and i hope folks can take this apply it to their careers their life and ultimately do something special in their careers um, and in their life so thank you for having me and keep doing the the great work thank you thank you all right ross thank you for that can you hold on one quick second right before i so i can sign off real quick i'm here i'm here all right all right let me go ahead and sign off real quick all right, guys, that concludes another episode of the SEO Video Show. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. And I will see you next week. Peace out. Thank you for watching. Hope you come back next week. Make sure to subscribe. You don't want to miss a thing. Hope you learn something new because the vibe is incredible. From the special SEO professionals, SEO video show. Let's work. Want to see you be an SEO expert. Paul Andre DeVera helping you step it up. No delay right now. Time to level up. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe. Woo!